Greetings everyone, and welcome back to Pep Organ. I'm very excited to share with you an interview that I conducted a few months ago with the legendary Australian organ builder, Ron Sharp. Before I share this with you all, I thought I should say a few things about Ron so that you're aware of who he is. Ron Sharp was born in 1929 and grew up in Sydney, where he has lived for most of his life. Being introduced to music from an early age, he discovered the organ and became interested in how they were made. Being dissatisfied with the English organs which populate the Australian churches, he took it upon himself to build his own organ. But he took the Baroque organ as his inspiration, which he had listened to many recordings of. Sharp's first organ was built in St Mary's Cathedral, Sydney in 1960, making it the first mechanical organ in Australia. In the following decades, he built many more high-quality organs which helped a generation of Australian musicians experience the beauty of classical-style organs for themselves. Many other organ builders imitated his principles, but Sharp has generally been considered the best of the movement, making his instruments musically warm through his meticulous voicing. Sharp's most famous organ is undoubtedly the one at the iconic Sydney Opera House. Completed in 1979, it remains as the largest mechanical instrument in the world. Although some have criticised Sharp's work for its unusual mechanical and tonal design, Many, myself included, have come to appreciate the unusual and unique beauty of these musical instruments. Personally, the very first organ that I played was built by Sharp. It was at the Wollongong Town Hall, and perhaps that is why I fell in love with the organ so quickly. Having spoken to Ron online, I think he's an excellent man. He is a great visionary with a great mind, and he was able to deliver what no Australian at the time could have. The way that he talks about music and about the organ is very interesting to me. It is evident that his work was not appreciated because organists were not able to reimagine how an organ should be played. I will leave it to other people to debate Ron's views on organ design, but I found his ideas fascinating and definitely worthy of respect. Now, I have a few things to say about the interview. Firstly, it was quite long, and to make what he says accessible, I have edited it down and added timestamps in the description section. So if you want to just listen to a particular topic, just have a look there and click the link. Furthermore, this was a general discussion, so some of what we said was either unnecessary to include, confidential, or personal, and these I have edited out also. Keep in mind too that Ron Sharp is in his 90s now, and while what he said was incisive and interesting, he did at times become confused and misremembered some things, so I've done my best to keep the interview cohesive. I've broken up the interview into two parts, so be sure to check out the second one. The first largely covers his life story, while the second focuses more on the story of the Opera House, and on his organ design. Before I conducted the main interview, I did have a quick FaceTime call with Ron. Being isolated from everyone except his direct family due to coronavirus, he actually really wanted just to hear some music, so I offered to play my violin for him. I want to hear you play your violin. I've, well, I've got it here. <laughs> Would you like to hear something? Uh, what sort of violin have you got? It's, um, I don't know too much about it. I know that it's about a hundred years old. It's French. Yeah. Uh, I've got a co copy of a Garnerius del Gaze that I want, would have liked you to play for me if you'd been able to come. Oh, wow. I've got it and it's, I haven't heard anyone play it yet, only myself. And a copy of a star. Uh, uh, see now, there's my brain gone again. Stradivarius. I've got a copy of a Steiner cello. And uh, you know, I get all these things to learn about them, but I don't follow through to final proficiency. I see. Yeah. I, um. So you play the violin too. Well, I I learn. You will not remember. There's a fellow called Giza Bartman who used to play on the radio and he'd play gypsy music. Right. Uh, I had two two or three 
reporters listened to his wife after he died. Right. She said I progress in one month, but anyone else would take a year to progress in. Wow. You see, but then I hurt my back and was on the floor for a week, and I gave it up. Oh. You know? I, I played in orchestras, yeah. I, I, I don't play so much anymore, um, but I did run string ensembles for a while. But playing in an orchestra is a, a marvellous thing, and I think that's maybe why I like organ so much, because it's, it's a similar feeling. When you play the organ, it's like playing in orchestra. Well, that's the world it's the world. <laughs> you like that? I do, yeah. <laughs> you can't learn the organ without loving the cinema organ as much as anything else. Right. I had a 315, I took it out of the State Theatre. It's still in Herschel. There's been a house built around it. Ah, oh, right, I've heard about it, yeah. John Atkinson, it's in Herschel. They're really wonderful. Did you hear the State Theatre organ in Sydney? In my early teens, we used to go to the state and see many errands come up out of the pit and turn round to the top. It was wonderful. Yeah. See, we've got a lot of talking to do, haven't we? I think we do. Do you think we should leave it to tomorrow? Well, it tears me up waiting for things <laughs> I've already got. <laughs> uh, I, think it's, I think it's better because I think a lot of people would like to hear just, just this kind of discussion. Without you asking any questions, I can go for half an hour. Exactly. And we'll start. So I have I have got questions that I can use to lead the conversation, but um, but I'm happy to let you speak as much as you'd like. You're a fantastic uh, person, you know. <laughs> well, Rob, this is all really really interesting. But we should talk a lot because you might be the way of getting some of these lost information out to the people who need it. No, absolutely. I completely agree. So let's let's um. I'm so sorry to do this, but I think we should postpone for till tomorrow because I don't want to repeat ourselves over and over. No. no. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ron. Terrific. Awesome. I'll see you tomorrow. Fantastic. All the best. Bye. Bye. We delayed the interview for a day so that Ron could use Zoom, thus enabling me to get a better recording of the interview. But it was already interesting to hear that Ron was such a fan of the theatre organ an organ style which was so diametrically opposed to his own. This was just one of many interesting things that made me really appreciate getting the chance to actually speak to him so I could hear his perspective on music. So now I'll not interrupt anymore and just let you enjoy the interview. Hello. Hello. Hi Ron, good to see you. <laughs> Well, like I said, thanks a lot for joining me on the, for the interview. And I hope that this one can be a little bit more informal and we can have a, have a more nuanced discussion about your life and about your music and your instruments. And I, I would like to get your opinion um, being, being of a completely different era to the generation of organists who are growing up now who don't know much about your time you brought me into a completely new world absolutely <laughs> it's it's a totally different world um you grew up before well before lots of things but the internet was a big one and the ability to travel overseas which i was thinking about a lot um it was much harder i think in your day especially by before you um in the 1950s for instance before there was mass travel, people didn't know what European organs, people couldn't go and visit them. Is that right? I went overseas in May 1969 when I signed the contract for the Opera House. Right. I turned 40 while I was in Canada. I see. So I didn't see the world before that. And when I was born in August 1929, 
the Great Depression started in October. I was only four, four weeks or so old when we were thrust into poverty. Wow. My father died when I was six. And my mother bought the house and brought two boys up on the widow's pension. Unbelievable. How was your childhood? How was my childhood? It wasn't very good. I was bullied by my, my grandparents came to live with us when my father died. And my grandparents bullied me. My grandmother bullied me into practicing the piano. And my grandfather bullied me into just being something to bully, you know, to, oh. to over, be overbearing. In. So uh, I uh, didn't have much of a childhood, but I was, I kept myself interested by playing with Meccano and playing the piano and uh, wanting the violin and waited till I actually got one. And, <laughs> when I was five, my mother bought the piano and I immediately walked up to it and played a tune that I'd heard on the radio. She took me to Woolworths in Rockdale right. and brought me a, a mouth organ. And as we walked out the door of the shop, I was playing Oh Sweet Home on it. Wow. <laughs> my father was a Scottish dancer. His brother had the bagpipes. I was hearing Scottish records that my mother had, you know, the good old tunes. Okay, right. My mother learned singing. She sang in the 5,000 voice choir when Sir Malcolm Sargent came out here. And she was singing all day, every day while she worked. So I heard all those tunes. Wow. The tunes and lovely. Irish tune, you know. So I did have a great feeling for music. In my teens, I developed hi-fi and uh, I sold a couple of hi-fi sets and friend and I, two friends and I built hi-fi sets for ourselves. I ended up building one of the best hi-fi systems you could ever want um, when I was married and living in Lugano in a good big room. Um, and had 170 loudspeakers. And you could play Sasson's organ symphony and feel the lowest note while you were sitting there. And the stereo image was such that you could walk the length of a 30 foot room across the system and the stereo image didn't alter. Wow. That was one of the things that I did, that I do with everything I do. I, I don't initiate something for myself. I get into it by someone else's influence, and then I improve things. That's how I got into organ building. In the organ society, we go and look at organs, like St Barnabas Broadway, and I was, couldn't stand it, it was horrible terrible tone, couldn't play them expressively. All they played was church music badly. And I think, well, oh, you know, I've got to do something. When I was at Sunday school, um, we had a three manual reed organ with dummy pipes, right. uh, pedals, you know. And I used to sit at that and look through the pedals down into the basement. <laughs> and. Uh, a friend from the church said, look, Ron, you play the piano, you must learn the organ. Well, I went to Jean McVay at Hurstville, and at the first lesson, she sat me down and said, now, Ronald, two things you need to know. When you sit at the console, you'll feel that you're going to fall forward and hit your nose on the keys. You're out of balance. I said, that's not right. He'll have to do something about that. And when you play a key, it'll, the note won't come immediately because it was pneumatic action. I said, I'll have to do something about that. So instead of learning the organ seriously, I learned how to make them. 
we right. went to the Mitchell Library for months and months, uh, reading all the books on all the building, Audsley and, and Navia Hunt and all the books that said this is how you make organs. These are organs in Europe. And I bought a whole lot of 12 inch LP recordings of the classical organs in Europe, played by Helmut Valka, Kapel, and uh, Lundberg, and a whole lot of the real gems of the classical German organs. Schnitger, Silberman, I had all those records in my head. And because I'd gone to symphony concerts at the town hall from the time I was, I left school, the first one we went to was while we were in high school, went to the town hall, Sir Bernard Hines playing school concerts. I was sitting there in the Southern Gallery looking at that massive organ. I thought, one day I'll play Bach's to Carter and Fugue in D minor on that. <laughs> I did play part of it. I hired the hall for an afternoon to research the organ on <laughs> while well, I had the organ job. Yeah, so, I've, I've played it there too, the same, the same piece. <laughs> well, it's a bit, bit tacky now. It's overplayed. Um, and uh, I noticed calling you up on the website uh, That's, you're right. In Wollongong. That's right. Now you must know Richard, Richard Tognetti. Yes, yes, I've met him. Um, did you play with him or uh, did he learn the same ahead of you or what? Um, we didn't, I didn't have lessons with him, but I do remember very well going to ACO concerts throughout all my childhood. I was in the green room at the Opera House when they we're talking about starting the ACO up. Really? Yeah. Wow. And uh, the last time I went to Wollongong Town Hall was a recital and Richard Tognetti's father was there and I met him. Yes, I've, I've met him many times. He's a lovely man. Yeah, he's a great man. Mm. But Richard's really an amazing person and you're the same. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that piece... You played on the violin, Marcus. Oh, took me back to the Lady Killers. <laughs> you played it absolutely perfectly. Oh, thank absolutely you. Absolutely on pitch for every note. Like, oh, you know, up to that, I didn't know you were so professional. <laughs> anyway, you want to ask questions? So, yeah. Um... I suppose once you'd heard the European organs and the Sydney Town Hall, you weren't too interested in reed organs anymore? Reed organs? Mm. Well, I wasn't really. It's just that the church, Presbyterian Church, had one, and that's what they played. And I wasn't interested. Ah, oh, okay. So it was always a pipe organ. But right, reed organs are and electronic organs are not much good. But I've got six piano accordions, and they're beautiful. Right. Piano accordion is a wonderful instrument, beautiful, lovely music to play on, and it's just so good. The same reeds sound different when you're pumping them, and when you've got a bass, and when they've got a, a, a vibrato, and they do in a church reed organ, which is boring. Ah, uh, right, because you can control the sound more. Well, I picked it up and I started to learn it, and then I taught my wife to play it. Yeah. yeah, I think I have a mixed opinion about that because I've I've played some very boring harmoniums, but I I do own one myself, um, and it's it's beautiful. It's um, it can be good. Mm. There's real harmonium. My grandmother, who was teaching me the piano, uh, played the reed organ in the local congregational church. And what church was it that you went to? The church, yes. Bexley Presbyterian Church, where my mother got married. Right, yeah, that, okay. That was in 1928. Yep. 
So what was the, uh, I was going to ask, what was the Australian organ scene like when you were just getting into it? Well, the society was founded by Howard Pollard, who's Professor Howard Pollard, who is now six months off a hundred. Wow. And, uh, and the other one was uh, uh, Dr. Vincent Shepherd. But I went to every meeting and he played, uh, some, someone played the organ to demonstrate it. Then after, after it all finished, uh, Norbert Kelvin would get up and play Vidor's to Carter as we all talked and had our tea and biscuits. And right. We, uh, and, and they went to all these organs and not once did they analyse tone. Ah, uh, okay. All, all I could hear was terrible tone and bad playing. And uh, St Barnabas, the hill in St Barnabas Broadway was one of their idols. Well, when I was learning at, the, at St James from Fort Salmon, I had three practice sessions on St Barnabas. I couldn't press the keys down. I couldn't express the note. And I couldn't stand the overbearing sound of the pipes. Right. The whole society idolised it. I mean, we went to one recital there, and Warwick Mahaffey, who was big in getting the opera house job, a, more, a silent worker behind the scenes, he was sitting down the front, and he put earplugs, earphones, you know, ear mm. silences on his ears through the recital. <laughs> They thought he was mad. He was the most intelligent and musical person there. Who'd want to hear it? All they wanted to do was have Anglican services. Yes. They allowed organ to lead hymns. It was perfect for the job. And the people who went there weren't necessarily highly music, musical and cheering the hymn. They thought it was lovely. I've been listening to uh, church church services on the ABC Channel 2 on Sunday mornings. They put on a church service with hymns. And the hymns that I love with the Anglican organ that I despised all those years, it's wonderful. I love it. But that's not advancing the organ. It's a no. musical instrument. You know, and you get a review or a write-up in the journal of a visit to an organ, and they tell you how many keys it has, and how long the pipe is, and who built it, and who installed it. Not one word to say, God, when can we improve the organ tone? You know, it had a, it had a harsh, wiry tone. Uh, the, the, the tenor diapasons whined. They didn't have a musical tone. They whined, you know, not one. And that's why I don't like the organ society. It's a problem that still happens today where people aren't, I mean, organists aren't switched in to using their ears and hearing the, the actual tone. I had an organ recital meeting in, in Holland. And I thought, this will be terrific. No different. There you go. So it doesn't matter about the quality of the instruments. They aren't listening. That's it. John Clancy, who bought the organ... Well, it's a, and put it in his house. He wrote, I, whether he wrote it down or said to me, if I go to an, or, uh, or is an organ recital and there's just one instrument other than the organ, I won't go. It had to be organ. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's so narrow. But I, I instantly saw it from earliest days, instantly saw then it was wrong. And what can be made, how can we make them musical? So what, what do you suggest about how we change this mindset of people so they listen better to the music? <clears throat> well, you can make an organ that the organ people will relate to real music, but they'll have to go to real music concerts. I've been to hundreds of concerts since I left school. I went to all the youth concerts. They had 
three three concerts at the town hall, all the same to fit in six thousand people because it only held two thousand. I had tickets to all of them. Go to each concert. I was there when Jeanette Never played her last concert here and went away and was killed in a plane crash later. I was there when uh, the, the training orchestra conductor, Robert Watts, he, he was there during Jeanette Never's recital of the Brahms and at the first break he fell off the chair onto the floor, collapsed because he was sick. She just stood there, waited while they carried him off, continued with the concert. Uh, I've been to so many concerts, classical music is in here. I've only got to hear a note or anything that's not right, I know instantly it's not music like that. Do you have a particular opinion about Suzuki? Suzuki? Well, Suzuki, you pick up the violin and you play a piece. The other method, you go, yeah, 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 you know, you go through all the exercises and all that. And you think, what are we doing this for? Yes. You know, music. When I picked up my first violin, I went from A to E. Oh, da da. Played Mendelssohn's spring song. First off, you know. And, and I can't stand the noise. The violin's so noisy. And I read how to make violins and I learned all about the sound post and the bass bar and all that. And I adjusted and it had a I, I put an ace gun A on it. It had a heavenly V for the E string and I adjusted up and it was so sweet and playable, beautiful. Because my ears right there, you don't want a big noise. So I had it all perfect. Well, I took it to Cedric Clark uh, to have something done to my other one. And anyway, and he said, oh, look, that's no good. I'll adjust it for you. He destroyed it. Oh. Just noise. See, they only work for the orchestra players who want something loud. Yeah. The same with my cello. I got uh, Barbara from Barbara Woolley. I said, play my cello. He said, oh, that's no good. You can barely hear it. You know, when you went to the quartet she played in, you couldn't stand the noise. It was horrible. Right. That quartet was horrible. And then there was the the, uh, uh, the string quartet that we all had to listen to for years. Donald Hazelwood was the leader. And I used to say, string quartets, I hate them. They're horrible. And then one day I went to a concert. It was the Amadeus string quartet. I said, that's what I've been talking about all these years. You know? It can make such a difference, can't it? People don't have any idea of tone. What's music? Music is rhythm, melody, harmony, tone, musicality, and an extra thing that's the person who's making it. You start with rhythm, and then the tune, and the something. I love harmony. You know, the, the accompaniment notes to things. Beautiful mm. song, mm. but, but you never hear that, and that, that's what it's like to listen to the the Laterno in the cathedral. Yes, <laughs> there's no no musicality, no no rhythm, no tune, no harmony, no tone. It's all dead. Well, I think that's where um. That's where, where your instruments come in to the, our discussion. I was doing evening classes at Sydney Tech in geology and mineralogy. And uh, the teacher there was from the university. He'd come to the Tech and teach. His, his son was one of the quiz kids on Radio 2GB. 
and after the after the night at the tech one night he said come up to the university and i'll show you something and we went in the back door to the great hall and he uh, went up said wait there went up and played hail the conquering hero comes of handle on the organ and he said now I'll come up and i'll show you the organ i said just a minute and i sat down to the organ pulled out some stops and played the Dakota in D minor. You know, <laughs> <laughs> now, Norman Johnson became the organist there and he wanted a new organ. Every time someone's appointed to be the organist, the first thing they want is a new organ, it's theirs. Doesn't matter how good it is. David Rumsey was organist in a church in Adelaide. And the front organ with, had 16 foot thing pipes, you know, it was a typical organ. <laughs> he was, one thing about Rumsey, although he tried to get me out of the business, was he wanted to be top man. He asked me if I'd make a new organ for the, the church for $6,000. Of course he'd seen the almond organ and knocks. I said, what do you mean? You want me to throw out a church organ with 16 foot pipes and make a four foot neoclassical squeaker in the same place? I'm not going to do that. You know? So he disliked that, disliked me for that. So did his wife when he got married to Krista. He went, he went to Leon Anton Harler in Vienna and he uh, he went there from from here from his lessons here and came after a cut back after a couple of years to show all us the income poops in Australia what an organ's got to be like you know well when he got arrived here I'd already got made an organ mm. There you go. <laughs> like that. And uh, anyway, he, uh, I got distracted. So let, let's talk about your first organ at St. Mary's Cathedral. Right. Now, a friend of mine who died two weeks ago, aged 89, Peter Ellicott, he was, uh, he worked on, um, office dictating machine, the electric sound was uh, intercom and things like that. And he, his mother was organist at the local church, so he was interested in organs. Mm. And he had a book called How to Make a Two Million Pedal Organ. And we looked at that and we looked at all the work and said, oh, you'd never make an organ. Like that, the work involved, you know. So he made an electronic organ. That was quite good, classical. And then he wanted to make a, an improved one. Well, the same as me in everything I did. If I wanted to make an improved something, I had to sell the one I had to finance the next one. I had to sell my beautiful glider to do something else. To, and anyway, and, and he made this second, second link, made second electronic organ, and he advertised it for sale. And the person came to buy it. The person was the manager at Woolworths in Camp C. You know where Camp C is? Yep. He was well, he was manager at Woolworths, and he had asthma. And he could play the piano and the organ, played the organ well, you know, like Chicago, you know, and theatre style. Uh, was. And the, the doctor told him to cure his asthma to learn singing. You can't believe the link of ordinary coincidences where they can lead, cause and effect, step by step. Yeah. Uh, so he went to the con learned from Florence Taylor. 
His name was Raymond Myers and he sang the Sutherland in La Scala Milan. And of course he had asthma. He was told to learn singing. And he was in the choir at St Mary's. Oh, you're in the choir at St Mary's. Tell him if they ever want an organ, I'll make them one. Just that sentence, one sentence. I'd been there with the organ society, heard the organ at the back with that reverberation. We played the old Jackson tracker action organ in the, in the Eastern transept. You don't remember that because we pulled it to bits. An old, dirty old two manual organ and the president of the organ society, Keith Johns, after we'd had the recital from the back organ for the society, and I was enthralled, he got up there and played Marcus to Carter in F. He couldn't believe it. Absolutely couldn't believe it. And uh, that's what I'd seen at the cathedral. So when Ray Myers said, I'm in the choir, I said, if, tell them if they ever want a, an organ, I'll make them one. You jump in. I was already starting to make one for myself. And uh, two weeks later, Father Harden, the music master, knocked on my door. I believe you want to make us an organ. He was my age, same name as me, Ron. We hit it off straight away. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what, what, what can we do? And I said, listen to this. And I, I played him some helmet the records with some samples of pipe, pipes out of couple. And then I picked up the, the organ pipes I'd made as samples. He said, it's the same as the organ, same as the German organ. So it took 18 months of experimenting and I got the job to make the organ. Fantastic. So what happened was, he said, well, let's, how can you make an organ? I said, well, we'll take the four foot principle out of the Jackson organ because it was defunct and I'd had to buy it. Oh, I was going to have to buy that as a trade in on the one I made. So I took the four foot principle out and I made a Winchester take the four foot principle and every valve was electric and it was a, a rolling valve on a curtain made out of uh, soup tin. You know how you've got a tin plate and it's curved, you cut a little piece out of that and it would roll on the end of a piece of cloth, wind, wind cloth, tight wind tight cloth that I'd seen in one of the books I'd read, the, the, uh, the London American Organ by, I forget what it was, and he showed how all these organs were made. And uh, I made the valves out of tins, and, and uh, I made the magnets out of welding rod. You know, I wound on the line, I wound the coil, then bent it round into a horseshoe, and that opened the valve, I made the entire valve. I made a row of those wow. on a wind chest box. And I had the wind chest, I had the wind supply that I'd made for the ABC's chamber organ I made that Charles McCarris wanted for the St. Matthew Passion. So when that was all over, ABC gave me that wind supply. That went up into the triforium. Oh, and I said, oh, we'll make an organ in the Trifurium. And Father Harden said, no, the organ builders say it's impossible to build an organ up there. You know, they wanted eight and 16 foot pipes standing up in that Trifurium. Oh, of course you can build a thing and lay them down, you put the small ones up. You know, of course you can build an organ. <laughs> so I put this four foot rank up there, ran, ran three leads, put the power onto it in the wind, ran some leads down, down the column, and I had an old keyboard that I put, put contacts on that, that, would, that it would work, and put that on a table in the, in the uh, 
sanctuary. And finally, he said, you can make an organ. You've got the job. Brilliant. So, so yeah. did, did you have a workshop yet at this point? No. No, I was renting, <coughs> renting the top flat over a, a, a shop in Bexley. And the, they had a back room, which was storage for their rubbish. Well, I... I had made it a casting table. I cast spotted metal. And I made a four foot pipe there. And, um, so I had that to make the pipes. And, uh, and at that time I got married for the first time, unfortunately, on the third now. And, um, I've helped and we started to make the organ um, up there and I I cast metal and made the, the bottom eight foot pipe as a positive get act and uh, and then we got on with it and then we found we there was a Factory for sale at Mortdale, which is the one I just sold, four thousand pound, pay off to the owner. He was moving out, and so we bought that and had a, a living quarters attached to it, and then we used that. That was the beginning of the factory, that front brick room, and so we made the organ there. Fantastic. So was there a was there a plan when you? were asked to make this organ. Was there a plan about how big the organ was going to be? Well, I was building my organ. That was, I was building my organ for the cathedral. You have to find a place to make it for and someone to pay for it, don't you? <coughs> and uh, so it was three, 3,000 pounds, out of which I had to pay them back 500 for the Jackson organ and they let me store it in the basement in the crypt and um, so I made it for 2,500 pounds that's what it cost to buy the I had to buy the rest of the pipes I couldn't take all the time to make them because uh, I got nothing out of it and getting into debt and made it and uh, when I made it with all its chorus, mixed the chorus on the grate and positive and the burden on the pedal, the sound was, you'd never heard an organ like that in Australia before. And, and we had someone come from America, I just dropped his name at the moment, an organist, and he played at the cathedral. He played mine and the Laterno. And Norman Johnson went to it. Unfortunately, I didn't go. I've never heard my organ played in years. And Norman Johnson said, wrote in the journal that he loved my organ the best because it was so clear and beautiful. Mm. Yeah. And you feel the top touch on it? Yeah, yeah. It's no marvellous. No one's ever done that here before. I did all that first time. In other words, I was building an organ and step by step I had to make it. And I read all about this top touch and I knew about top touch from St. Barnabas and those places. So I made a mild top touch because being in the cathedral so far away from the pipes, you had to have a feel in the key to play it. If it didn't have top touch, you wouldn't know whether you were playing because the sound was 50 feet away. Right. So I, I put top touch, but I don't believe in top touch. You shouldn't have it. Since I left organ building and got into piano tuning and an improvement, the piano doesn't have top touch. And all these famous musicians playing the piano, it doesn't. 
you don't have to press it and it falls away. Mm. But when, when the heavy touch of St. Barnabas fell away, it did suddenly. You could not press it slowly to express the speech. Right. You could have played the note hard or you didn't play it. So do not believe in, in top touch. The Opera House hasn't done it. The Opera House has got 57 notes on one key on the grate. And you can twist a wire in the chest at the back and you can either have top touch or eliminate it completely or have whatever you want in between. 26 draw stops on the grate at the Opera House, 57 pipes from 16 foot up. And you can adjust it to have no top touch. Right. And when you pull <coughs> one, if you've got one rank of pipes on the grate, you can pull 50 other ranks and that one pipe doesn't go flat for loss of wind and the others. Now, Great. People rave about modern organ building, like the one who's going to build a new St. James organ. It might be a great organ, and it might match musicality that I believe in. I'm worried about it. I've never heard any organ that has my uh, musical regulation 